and are heavy, heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, and ye shall find rest. My burden is light, and you shall find rest unto your souls, and ye shall find rest unto your soul, and you shall find rest.
The heavens and the earth were finished And all the host of them And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made And He rested on the seventh day From all His work which He
time, Lord, for thee to work, for they have made for thy love. It is time, Lord, for thee to work, for they have made for thy love. Thy Righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy love is the truth. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, even by the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of your holy angels, as we embark upon the eve of this Sabbath day, we gather together to, ra- to praise you to hear you speak to these hearts of ours, to, Lord, to put a nail in a sure spot in our hearts, that we might grow in grace, and that we might reflect the very thoughts of a living God and his character will be manifest. So bless us now as we open up your holy word. Guide us with your Holy Spirit. Let your angels be in our fellowship, keeping back seen and unseen distraction that would interfere with us hearing you speak. And let our hearts as a result of this, be truly transformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. For in his name we pray, for his name's sake, amen. Amen and amen. All right, we have approached another Sabbath Eve, preparation time. So, what you see up on the screen there? White raiment. White raiment. In these last Fridays, we've been in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Looking at the seventh church. Now, what is that seventh church called? Anybody know? The se- Laodicea. The seventh church. So tell my IT man to put me on the screen here. Put me on the screen. Mm-hmm. I hear them back there. So let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Mm hmm. All right, excuse us right now there. What's going on here, huh? It's showing your whole screen. Mm -hmm. Good, you're good. We good? Put me up there then. Thank you. (laughs) So anyway, we have looked at in the past, we looked at the uh, gold tried in fire, all right? Gold tried in fire. Now, that gold tried in fire is faith and love. Faith and love. Now, why is tried in fire? What does it mean to be tried in fire? What does it mean? That word tried in fire. Tested. Tested. Trial. We don't have no mic. So, therefore, it is the Christian whole life is to have trials. Right? Okay, and so there's a purpose behind those trials. And the purpose is to? To increase your faith, that's practical. That's right. Um, and to have um, a better, closer walk with Christ. That's right. So therefore, the trials, we, not, we need not to fight against the trials or become discouraged because it's necessary because it said go tried in fire. That means it's a purifying process. So if we want to be pure, Therefore, we just said, Lord, thank you for the trials. And what we should pray for is grace, grace. So in Revelation chapter 3, we see up here the Laodicea from 14 to 22, the seventh church. Laodicea means people judge. Now, Laodicea was definitely a city that was increased with material wealth. We understand that material wealth. They was known for their uh, merchandise oils and eyesight. And then also they had what you call black wool, black wool. You know, parts as we travel around the country, uh, we have seen sheep, black wool. You ever seen a black sheep? Black wool. Yeah, they, they exist. So God is saying now there's three remedies 
that God offered to the Laodicean church. Three remedies. Now, we talked about one, gold, tried, and fire. And last week, we talked about the other remedy. Anybody remember? I salve. I salve. That's all right. I salve. That's all right. We got a friend. I salve. Anointing. Now, that I salve is very important because God wanted to give us clarity so we can see our own condition. Amen. So most of the time, our eyes are on other people and what they're doing and not doing. So God wants to give us keen discernment so we can discern what's going on in this heart of ours, that we can apply these remedies. So now we're going to look at, it goes at the top. Let's look at verse 18 in Revelation. It says here, the counsel of the true witness says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, try in fire. That's what it says. And that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eyesight, that thou may, might see. So here we see that we are counseled to buy this gold and this white raiment. So how do we buy? We talked about in Isaiah 50. I think it was 50, 155. Hold, everyone that comes to the water, thirst, buy without money. So how do we get this gold tried in fire? Even now, how do we get this white raiment? We have no money. Therefore, we miserable and poor. So there got to be something that given an exchange for this gold and this white raiment. We talked about that last time. That's all right. We talked about that. So what we have to buy this is to exchange, exchange our filthy garments for God's righteous garment. We exchange our sinful ways for God's righteous. That's what we have. We are to acknowledge our need, and therefore God said, come as you are. I think that makes sense. So this white raiment. So let's look at it a little bit of this white raiment. It says that thou madest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. If we go back to Genesis for a moment. Let's take our Bibles, I believe, to the book of Genesis. Let's see what took place in the early history of our Parents, Adam and Eve. I believe we're going to look here at Genesis. All right. And we'll pick up here at Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> All right. Well, we need to go to Genesis chapter 3. I'm sorry. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. So in Genesis chapter 3, you remember that God had already warned Adam and Eve that they should not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for they will surely die. And so we find in Genesis chapter 3, Eve is now in a conversation with God's adversary. And now we're going to pick up here Well, well, let's let's start at verse one. All right, verse one, Genesis chapter three, verse one. It says, "Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made." And he said unto the woman, "Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden?" Now God had told Adam and Eve in the beginning that the tree in the midst of the garden, you got the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And what he commanded Adam and Eve, he said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. That's what God said. You will surely die. So the devil saying here now, we find, yea, has God said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden? 
And the woman said unto the serpent, I'm in chapter 3, verse 2, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, now listen what the woman said, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. I think we went over that before. Did God say do not eat or touch? Or did he say do not eat? Do not eat. He said do not eat. So what has happened here that Eve added to the word of God. Now remember in our conquest against sin that our mindset has to be changed. So therefore thoughts only come from two places. Either God or the adversary. Now whatever is planted in our mind it become rooted there, and through those thoughts that's in our mind, we interpret things. So when Eve listened to the devil, he said, you will surely die, not die. Then she added to God's word what we just saw, because it says, and the serpent said unto the woman, verse 4, ye shall not surely die. Now, remember this. Let's go back to verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, this is the woman quoting, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Hmm. So, when we look at chapter 2, verse 17, listen to what God said. Well, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, said, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So on chapter 3, we said the devil said you're not going to surely die. Because Eve already said what God said, don't eat it, don't touch. So therefore... That gave the devil leeway because the devil knows the word of God better than you and I. And so when she said, don't touch it, the devil said, you know, you might say, uh-huh. Now I have an avenue to a soul. So I asked a question earlier today when I was talking to some health guests. I said, how did Eve get that fruit? Well, she did not take the fruit from the tree. The Bible says she took it. She took it. That means the devil gave it to her. And she took it. That's what happened. He, she did not pluck the fruit from the tree. The devil took the fruit from the tree, gave it to Eve, and she took it from him. Now, what happened when she took that fruit? Did she die? No, she no. did not die. She did not die. Now, let's go on. We're going to see something. We'll get back to this nakedness here. In verse 6, 5. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. This is where the stinking thinking come in at. As we receive those thoughts, stinking thinking produce smelly lies. Now you're going to be like gods. You're going to be able to know how to uh, navigate your life. You're going to be able to distinguish between good and evil. And verse 6 says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for the food, I mean, it, it appeared luscious to the eyes, probably the aroma, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So the devil is on the tree, took the form of a serpent, beautiful animal at that time, I mean, glittering wings and et cetera, et cetera. And as she took the fruit into her hand, nothing happened to the Eve. She did not surely die. Therefore, that thought process set her up for a downward path. So she had the fruit in her hand. Nothing happened. Began to really adore it. Then she took the fatal step. She ate of the fruit. And that was the very format which the devil saw when we do not hold to the truth of God's word. When we misinterpret it, 
or when we add to it, that gives him entrance into our minds. So when they both partook of the fruit, their eyes did come open. In verse 7, it says, the eyes of them were both what? Open. And they knew that they were what? Naked. And they did what? Sow fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. I want you to remember that. When they disobey God and they were covered with a heavenly garment, light surrounded them. They weren't naked in the beginning. They were covered with light. They were covered with light. Happy and blessed Sabbath to my meat ministry family. Praise God, Sister Bernelda. They were covered with light. And when they partook of that forbidden tree, that light disappeared. And they recognized now they were naked. Keep that in mind. Because we read in Revelation chapter 3 that we want to buy this white raiment that we might be clothed and our shame of that naked may not appear. So how do we end up naked in the first place? Thank you, Dusty. Good evening, Dr. Jackson. How do we end up like that? We just saw that. It was a disconnection. You remember if you unplug a, a, a socket from the light, from the plug, power goes off. So they unplugged from God. They unplugged from God. They went into darkness. But they knew they was naked. Now let's go back to Revelation. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. Keep this in mind. God is admonishing us, exhorting us to buy this white raiment. And we need to find out, because some of us already know what it is, but we need to know how we get this and how do we hold on to it. This white raiment is very important. That the, that the shame of our nakedness does not appear. So let's read that again. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Revelation 3, verse 18, it says, I counsel thee to buy what? Gold. Gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and, and that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Get that in mind. This is the shame of thy nakedness. Now, we got to go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis because that shame, we heard that word before. Has anybody ever been shamed here, out there? I am confused. If he added to God's word, would that be considered a lie? Well, most definitely it's a lie. Don't, do we do that all the time? The Bible says, if you add to my word, take away my word, I'm going to add to the plagues to your name. Most definitely it was a lie. Hmm? But the devil deceived her. The devil took advantage of her weakness of the thoughts. So in Genesis, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. You, I'm glad you're with me out there. Yes, it was definitely a lie. And we do not want to live a lie. We want the truth. And we don't want to tamper with God's word. So we see in chapter 3 in verse 7. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sowed fig leaves. Keep that in mind, because that's going to come back. They sowed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves. Number one, they were shamed. Fearful. Why? They were naked. Prior to that, they were clothed with a heavenly garment. Therefore, they were able to commune with God face to face. When they disconnected with God, then that covering, that light covering disappeared. Now they hide themselves. You see, that's what we do, folks, and what God don't want us to do. When we find ourselves caught in sin. Guilty, shame. We try to cover up, but God is loving. He's merciful. 
He, all he wants from us is a cry out, say, Lord, forgive me. And so we do not want to cover our guilt. Alex says that means she sinned before eating the fruit. Well, she disconnected herself. See, remember the mind, the mind. See, when you are born again, my friend, you get another mindset that now can really understand and receive the word of God. So Eve, she was deceived, clearly deceived now, where she entered into that mindset and began to add to God's word. So sin entered in before eating the fruit. Well, before entering the fruit, we find that the mindset, you can, you see, God said, you know, temptation is not sin, is yielding to sin, the Bible says. And therefore, the battle of the mind. Satan was able to take the advantage of Eve's spiritual position because she was out of harmony with God's word. And so we can say the thought, her thought was not the thought of God because God did not say, do not touch. So you might say it started right there in the mind. Yes, it started in the mind. And then it played out in the actually act. Keep this in mind. The mind. This is where the battle is. So, yes, Mike. Question. Um, is reproach and sh shame like one in the same? Similar. Reproach the Lord. You can bring reproach or bring shame. So when Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1, and says, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, Amen. saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by name by thy name to take away our reproach. Is that like shame? Yeah, that's shame. Most definitely. Most definitely. Take away the shame. You, you see, you find here when we talk about shame, we see nakedness. Because in wearing their own peril, it's not according to God's word. So their nakedness and their shame is revealed. Hello? We see it today in society, the way we dress. We expose parts of our body that never should be exposed to. So we go back now. Remember, it says the shame of thy guilt. We go back to Revelation. So you got to get this before we come down to the conclusion of the matter that this white raiment is necessary to cover up that shame of thy nakedness, but it's not when I say cover up, God not going to give us this white raiment while we holding on to the very cause of our nakedness. I hope we clear out there also. So back to Revelation. Again, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and that and not the eyes with eyesight that thou mayest see. So we can see our shame and our nakedness. Okay, I think I'm getting it. I need to pray to God for more clarity. Thank you, Brother Pastor. Well, the point is, my friend, that even though Eve had added to God's word, definitely it was not God speaking through her. All right? She had disconnected. So remember, where does the battle begin? It starts right in the mind. When we begin to make decisions that's contrary to the will of God, it's going to take us down the path that's contrary to the will of God. And so therefore, simply take this in mind now. Take this in mind. I want you to stay focused here so you don't lose it. You can continue to study this, but I want we talk about this white raiment and why we need this white raiment and when it says to cover the, the shame of that nakedness. I don't want you to lose that point because this nakedness that God is talking about in Revelation took place in Genesis chapter 3. We were in a sinful condition, nakedness. I mean, our very life was naked, shameful, contrary to the will of God. Very important to understand that. So don't lose the point by trying to, you know, stretch your mind. I want you to understand, are we naked in God's eyes? Then we can expand on whether that sin took place in the mind. Everything started in mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Keep that in mind. So this nakedness is very important. 
that I want us to lose this. Let me share a few points here. Because it's talking about this raiment by me. Now, what? Let me share this. It says here that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of the naked do not appear. And I have a, have a thought right here. I want to read this to you. And you can get these notes. It says, the soul may be naked when the body is well clothed. D do you hear that? The soul may be naked while the body is well clothed. That's right. You get that? We can be well clothed. We can be even dressing uh, in a very dignified way. Dressing away. But the soul is naked. We're talking about our spiritual inward man. We, we can have the form of godliness and denying the power thereof. All right? I hear the question. Would it be correct saying they're misinterpreting God's word? She opened to herself. Well, definitely. Anytime you misinterpret, misapply God's word, you open up your pathway for Satan to take advantage. Because when he heard Eve said, don't touch, that was his entrance. Because he knew God didn't say that. Hmm? So he gave it to Eve. And so she didn't die. So that kept that that caused her to go the next step. Keep that in mind when you misinterpret or add to God's word. So I want to state this again. It says here, the soul may be naked when the body is well clothed. And notwithstanding a man's moral righteousness. What is moral righteousness? You know, we have moral people. You know, you got people who are very moral and did with business, man, moral integrity, and which is good. That quality come from God. But listen what it says. It says, notwithstanding a man's moral righteousness, he may not be clothed. Mm. They and they only are clothed who have on the righteousness of Christ. So you can have morality, dignity, so-called, but if you don't have Christ, then you're still in a lost condition. People can do correct things. You can make, meet nice people, and that's good, because all good things come from God. But if that person does not have Christ covering on, that person is a walking dead person in right garments. Listen further to what it says as we move on. Further says here, nakedness, nakedness arise from want of righteousness, which is only covered by the righteousness of Christ. And from hence, also spring shame, which Christ's righteousness hide. When we go to God with our shame and our guilt and confess to him, he said he will confess I'm faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. He would exchange those garments. Now, what is this raiment? Another thought. Turn to, with me to Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. Revelation 19. This righteousness. What is this righteousness? Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. Listen what it says. Revelation chapter 19, 7 and 8. It reads, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife is has made herself ready, the marriage. Let's go down and read. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is what? The righteousness of the saints. Very important to understand. The linen, the righteousness of the saints who have made themselves ready for the marriage. So we now know that white represents righteousness. So that's what we need, righteousness, all right? Another thought real quickly. Now, you're, I don't know, go to Matthew, because you might not, you, you remember this, this marriage supper, go to, let's go to Matthew. 
Matthew 22. And then we'll come back here. We've got a few more moments. We're talking about this marriage, this wedding. In Matthew chapter 22, we don't have time to read everything, but you can read from 1 to 14. Matthew 22. So we know the white garment is the righteousness of the saint. But let's look at Matthew 22. All right. Now you have a you have a mic. So Tara, just really want to read a few verses for me. Matthew 22. And let's start. I want you to read verse one. And uh, we're going to 114. Let's read them down. All right. For the sake of time, let's do this. Let's go ahead and start at verse 1. Okay. And read on down for me uh, okay. to verse 8. Okay. Matthew 22, verse 1 through 8. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage mm -hmm. for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my mm -hmm. fatlings, are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their own ways, mm -hmm. one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. Mm -hmm. Verse 8. Yes, sir. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Uh -huh. So the wedding was ready. Those that were bidden, it's like there's a marriage going on, and therefore we are bidden come to that. Then it goes on down in verse 9. It says, Go ye therefore. Now, there was a group that rejected. Now, God sent out his servants, and he said, Go therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. Mm -hmm. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Verse 11. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. It's very important to understand this. In verse 12, and he said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, when we're talking about few are chosen, God is not uh, biased. He called everyone, but everyone have the choice to receive it. Now, in my notes here, I have a thought on this. It says here, By the king's examination of the guests at the feast is represented a work of judgment. When the king came in and examined the guests, that is a work of judgment. The guests at the gospel feast are those who profess to serve God. Those whose names are written in the book of life. But not all who profess to be Christians are true disciples. Before the final reward is given, it must be decided who are fitted to share the inheritance of the righteous. This decision 
must be made prior to the second coming of Christ. So we don't get right at Christ's coming. This must be done prior to his coming. It goes on and says, for when he comes, his reward is with him to give every man according as his work shall be. That's Revelation 22, 12. Before his coming, then, before his coming, then the character of every man's work will have been determined and to every one Christ follows, the reward will have been approached a portion according to his deed. So when we got to be ready at, the t- at Christ's coming? No, we need to be ready before he comes. Character. Now, it goes on and says here, it is while men are still dwelling upon the earth that the work of investigated judgment takes place in the courts of heaven. It says the lives of all who profess who all his professed followers pass and review before God are all examined according to the record of the books of heaven. And according to his deed, the destiny of each is forever fixed. Ever fixed. Keep that in mind. So, skip on. Therefore, the judgment is going on. We have to receive this righteousness. Now, let me get to the very essence now. Yeah? Now, what does the white robe rep- white raiment represent? All right. Now, this wedding garment in the parable is represented, it represents the pure, spotless character which Christ's true followers shall possess. To the church, it is given that they should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. That's Revelation 19, 8, Ephesians 5, 27. And we already read the fine linen is the righteousness of the saint. The white robe of innocent was worn by our first parents. Remember that? And they lost that robe. And that's because of transgressing the law of God. And so it goes on further, it says, only the covering which Christ himself will provide. And this robe is woven in heaven. We go on down. Now, the guests at the marriage feast were inspected by the king. Only those who, only those were accepted who had obeyed his requirement and put on the wedding garment. So with the guests at the gospel feast, all must pass the scrutiny of the great king. And only those are received who have put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. So righteousness is right doing. And it is by their deeds that they all be judged. Our characters are revealed by what we do. What y'all think about that? Our characters are revealed by what we do. Processing that, huh? Well, my question is, in regards to what we do, when the Bible says it is actually him that is doing it in us. True. So if we are cooperating with Christ, the character that's being judged is Christ's character. The character that's not. Okay. It says here, righteousness is right doing. All right. Then it goes on and says. And it's by their deeds they will be judged. Our characters are are revealed by what we do. The works show whether the faith is genuine. Now, what about this scripture? By their fruits you should know them. Hmm? So what is that saying to us? By our fruits. Those fruit represents our character. So therefore, now, let's go back, as you say, we go back to John chapter 15. And when Christ said in verse 2, every branch that abide in me does not bear forth fruit, I take it away. Every branch that's in me that bear fruit, I purge it 
that it bring forth more fruit. So the branch connected with Christ received the life of Christ, as you stated. The life of Christ flows into the person, to the branch, produce the fruit. So the branch, you and I, John 15, 5, we are the branches. So the branches do not produce fruit. It is Christ through the Holy Spirit that produced the fruit in us. And that's what the world see. So what you're saying is Christ living in us. And so when it says here, our characters are revealed by what we do. So that means if you're walking on this earth, a professed Christian, and as you interact with other people, and as you engage in work activities, as you face trials and tribulations, it's what is manifest in how you, re how you de respond to those situations. Let me give you a case of point. Say, therefore, you are end up with contention with, with, with another individual. Contention. Hmm? Now, how you respond in that situation will reveal your character. So if the contention gets so heated up and you get heated up and then you will speak words that would not be redemptive. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. So out of the heart, the mind, your thinking going to produce those words if Christ is not there. So it is truly that our characters are revealed by what we do. That's why it says character is revealed in crisis. So when we are faced with this crisis that's coming shortly upon this earth in Revelation chapter 13, when you and I cannot be able to buy and sell and are forced that we might violate the seven-day Sabbath. That's a crisis. Would you say so? Absolutely. All right, then. So in that crisis, character going to be revealed. Whether you're going to take the mark or the seal of God. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So now what God does for us now to help us to, to receive this righteousness, he will permit, allow what I call quizzes in our lives. Little quizzes. You might look at it being, you know, irrelevant, but every, every situation God has his hand on. So the statement is held to be true. Our characters are revealed what we do. Even what we say. It goes on further to say, it is not enough. Listen, it is not enough for us to believe that Jesus is not an imposter. And that the religion of the Bible is no cunning fable, devised fable. We may believe that the name of Jesus is the only name under heaven whereby men may be saved. And yet we may not, through faith, make him our personal savior. Did you hear what I just read? We may believe Jesus is not an imposter. We may believe in the name of Jesus, that's the only name in heaven and earth where we can be saved. And yet we may not, through faith, make him our personal savior. You see, it's not enough to believe the theory of the truth. What is meant by the theory of the truth? We have a mental accent to it. So basically Christ is coming for people who have a spotless character. Amen, Chris. Most definitely. We'll see this. Ephesians 5 talk about that without spot or wrinkle. And that got to start. With us, we need this raiment, white raiment. It says here, it's not enough to make a profession of faith in Christ and have our names registered on the church roll. He that keepeth his commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abided in us by the spirit which he has given us. Hereby we do we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's 1 John 3, 24. Christ abiding in us. 1 John 2, 3. This is the genuine evidence of conversion. What's the genuine evidence of conversion in that statement? Christ abiding in us. And what's the evidence that he's abiding? The fruit. Now remember in 1 John 3, you're right, it says here, 
He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abide in us. So how do we know he abide in us? By us keeping Keeping his commandments. commandments. Listen to what it says. That's what it says. By the spirit which he has given us. So when we're abiding in Christ, remember the vine and the sap. When we're abiding in Christ, the sap is symbolic of the Holy Spirit that produces the good works. Well, either have the fruit of the Spirit or the works of the flesh. That's true. And that's what God is seeking to rescue us from. Let's move on down to a few other thoughts here. It says, the truth is to be planted in the heart. It is to control the mind and regulate the affections. The whole character must be stamped with the divine utterance. Every jot and tittle of the word of God is to be brought into the daily practice. And what it says is the truth must be planted in the heart. Now, do you believe that that those of us walking around in the ministry may have the outward layers of this raiment that we have a clear understanding of who Christ is, of his work, of his saving grace, and not having the heart that brings forth righteousness. Could that be? Because the layer of the sin, you had God, well, this is what God said. He said, I wish you were hot or cold. That's what he says. I wish you were hot or cold. Now, Laodicea was the, 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 the place geographically was known for its hot springs. Hot, hot. And therefore, we mix with that cool, cold water. Then it become lukewarm. And God said, this makes me sick. I can, I can vomit you up. See, lukewarm water is not very soothing to the body. So God said, I wish you were hot or cold. Now, hot, you have a a passion and a zeal for Christ. Passion. Coldness, you totally oblivious of Christ's love. Totally. God said, look, hot or cold, make a decision. And so the truth must be implanted in the heart. Now, it's very important. I want to read a few more statements as we close out. Now, the righteousness, this white raiment is the righteousness of Christ. We all agree with that. Amen to that? All right. Now, let me share maybe some practical things here. Let me go back down. It says, while the angels hold the four winds, We are to work with all of our capabilities. We must bear our message without any delay. We must give evidence to the heavenly universe and to men in this degenerate age that our religion is a faith and a power of which Christ is the author and his word, the divine oracle. Human souls are hanging in the balance. They will either be subject for the kingdom of God or slaves to the despotism of Satan. All are to have the privilege. Who should have the privilege? All of laying hold of the hope set before them in the gospel and how they can hear without a preacher. Hmm. The human family is in need of a moral renovation, a preparation of character that they may stand in God's presence. They are souls ready to perish because of the theoretical errors which are prevailing and which are calculated. Calculated, it says here. Calculated to counterwork the gospel message. Then the question arises, who will, who will now fully consecrate themselves 
to become laborers with God. And here's a thought here. And I'll give you these notes that I'd like for you to consider it. I'm going to drop on down. It says here, brother and sisters, who have long claimed to believe the truth. Let's talk to you and I. Who have long claimed to believe the truth? Then he says, he says I ask you individually, have your practice been in harmony with the light, the privileges, and the opportunities granted you of heaven? Now, what is meant by that? The, the light, the privileges, and opportunities. What are those privileges and opportunities that God has granted us that we might become knowledgeable of these truths? For example, as we said here, as we study, as they gather on, on the stream in there, those are opportunities and privileges. Prayer meetings, church service, holy convocation, camp meetings. Every time where God's word is spoken unadulterated, those are privileges and opportunities for us to hear the word of God. In your own home, Bible studies, prayer, those are privileges and opportunities. To engage yourself in serving others through the word. Those are privileges and opportunities that has been granted us. This is a serious question. The son of righteousness has risen upon the church. And it is the duty of the church to shine. It is the privilege of every soul to make advancement. Advancement, not to be stagnated. Advancement. Those who are connected with Christ. Now listen to this. Those who are connected with Christ will grow in grace, in the knowledge of the Son of God, to the full statue of men and women. If all who claim to believe the truth had made the most of their ability and opportunities to learn and to do. So when we neglect the opportunities God has given us, we're not going to make it. It goes on, it says, they would have become strong in Christ. Whatever their occupation, whether they, whether, whether they were farmers, mechanics, teachers, or pastors, if they had wholly consecrated themselves to God, they would have become efficient workers for the heavenly maker. Those are very powerful words and serious question. Have we taken advantage? And the final th thoughts here, when our hearts are aglow with love for Jesus and the souls for whom he died, success attend our labors. I'm going to say that again. When our hearts are aglow, that means when the Spirit of God is in you and I, it radiates for Jesus and the souls of whom he died. Success will attend our labors. And then she says, my heart cries out after the living God. I want a closer connection with him. I want to realize his strengthening power. That I might do more effective work in his cause. And I want my bright, I want my brethren and sisters who are here to be blessed spiritually and physically. Hello, Veronica. Blessed spiritually and physically. I entreat you to be men and women of prayer. Very important, folks. Do not seek your own pleasure and convenience, but seek to know. And to do the will of God, let each one inquire, can I not point some soul to the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world? Can I not comfort 
some desponding one, can I not be the means of saving some soul in the kingdom of God? Do you hear that? We want the deep movements of the spirit of God in our hearts that we may not only be able to secure for ourselves the white raiment, but that we may so influence others that their names may be entered into the book of life, never to be blotted out. Hmm. God is now testing and proving his people. Character is being developed. Angels are weighing moral worth, keeping a faithful record of all the acts of the children of men. Among God's professed people are corrupt hearts. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Corrupt hearts, but they will be tested and proved that God who reads the heart of everyone will bring to light hidden things of darkness. You can't hide from God where they are often least suspected. You get that? Least suspected. That stumbling blocks. St Go back to the part where you read about grow. Can you go back to there? It Was says it here, grow? when our hearts are aglow. No, grow. Okay. Grow. Success, strength, do not seek pleasure. The paragraph ahead of the, not when you see the opportunities. Let me, let me read it here. It said, brothers and sisters who have long claimed to believe the truth, I ask you individually, have your practices been in harmony with the right light, with the light, the privileges and opportunity granted you to heaven? This is a serious question. The son of righteousness has risen upon the church and it is the duty of the church to shine. It is the privilege of every soul to make advancement. Those who are connected with Christ will grow in grace and the knowledge of the Son of God to fulfill to the full stature, rather, of men and women. It, if all who claim to believe the truth and made the most of their abilities and opportunities to learn to do, they would have become strong in Christ. Whatever the occupation whether they were farmers, mechanics, teachers, or pastors, if they had wholly consecrated themselves to God, they would have become efficient workers for the heavenly master. Okay, so it says, in Christ you will grow in grace. Mm -hmm. Is it possible... Um, Put the mic, put up. Being in Christ mm. and you and you fall. Is it possible? Is it possible? Yes. Does that mean Christ is not in you when you fall? Well, you disconnect. You're not see when, when a person falls, you and in Christ, because we, we have the evidence through the scripture. When you fall, that means you have lost sight of Christ. Okay, so that means put the mic. I haven't even I lost my so, thought. <laughs> remember this, that when you connect with Christ, anyone, that walk got to be consistent and continuously. And therefore, we know the adversary, soon a person genuinely, truly repent and connect themselves with God, it's going to encourage the wrath of the devil. So when you accept Christ, doesn't mean you are exempt from trials and tests. It's going to become more intensified. The battle becomes more, more fervent. And so you cannot be for one moment not maintain that connection through fervent prayer, devotional study of his word, and by sharing your life story with other people. So these are, these are the very tools that God has given us to maintain this walk and to have this white raiment to the end. Now, if you unconsciously and not willingly fall, 
comes in, devil comes in, catch you unaware. That means then that you were in Christ, but that fall and made a disconnection. But I want to read something here as we close out. Christ has not forsaken you. There's something if I can find it real quick. So I think your question, if a person falls, doesn't mean that they're not in Christ. Now, people in Christ fall. Doesn't mean they have to fall, but they fall because they have lost sight of the one who is their deliverer and sustainer. You get what I'm saying? Okay, so back to the word grow. Yeah. It's not something that is a snap and it's right there. So it's a process of growing. That's what you call sanctification. Right. Now, so. you remember, we, we talked about uh, in our Wednesday night meeting, we talked about putting off the old man mm -hmm. and putting on the new man. All this is ties in. And the person said to you, good question, sister. <laughs> That's what Veronica said. I hope we're going to get this clear because if you're in Christ and the reason you fall because you have not maintained the walk through, I'm going to repeat it again, through fervent prayer. Your prayer life would take on a whole different dimension. Your prayer life would not be light and frivolous. You could be praying and wrestling with God to maintain this walk and give you grace for victory and your study life is not like listen to a tape, watching a video, you into the word of God. As we're told, when we study the word of God, we got to take every verse and study it until it become our thoughts. That's how we become changed. Because surface readers are not going to make it. Not going to make it. And then our testimony should be of such a quality that when you are sitting down and studying with people and you can bear witness you know, yes, it's nothing wrong with testimony where God rescued you from falling off a cliff and et cetera, et cetera. That's all right. But you want to testify how God has brought you out of pit of darkness into his marvelous light. What he has done in changing your heart where you used to rise up when you are agitated and when you are disturbed by people conversation, you no longer are rising up because God is working in you and you're able to give a soft answer. That's the type of witness that God is looking for. That's the type of witness that's going to strengthen you. So if a person falls and they don't get back up through Christ, they stunt their growth. But if they mm -hmm. repent and get back up, they're still in the process of growing. All right. Now. Case in point, Let, let's take, those, those are a good question because your sister uh, uh, streamers, thank you for the question. That's good. Now, you're taking, here you go, look. You're taking steps, right? You're taking steps. Now, you push back. Push back. Now, what is that an indication of? Now, you've taken two steps. Then you've been pushed back. Say you take, push back one step. Do you gain or do you lose? Do you gain or do you lose? You lose a step, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that your, your growing process is being hindered. So God will pick you up out of that miry clay and set you back on the pathway that you might continue your walk with God and that he will give you power to catch up if I use that word, but the fact is that you might reach that high calling because you could be knocked down because remember the high calling is found in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, when Paul said, I press towards the mark, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So we got to keep our eyes on the prize. So if I get knocked back and God lift me up, when I come up off of that ground by God's grace with true confession and repentance, he said, I will forgive you and cleanse you. And so we can move on. So and, with, go ahead. And that is with willful and unwillful sin, correct? Well, unwillful sin, I mean, the devil tricked it's you. it's not knowing, you know. Right, and, it's not knowing. But the one that you do know and yeah. you did it, that's the willful. And, but Yes, and the danger of that if we keep that type of walk is deadly because it's weakened mm. our faith. And our confidence. It's like, you know, I have that. I keep bending back and forth, back and forth. It's going to break. It's going to break. So I can say, yeah, if I fall, I can get back up and start where I left off at. No, you, 
you, you'd have lost some grounds. Huh? You don't want to go backwards. You want to go forward. But in case that you can be caught unawares and you fall, it's not a choice of yours, but you were caught unaware. God will lift you up, give you grace and strength that you might continue that journey. Mm -hmm. And if he see fit that you live, you will reach the high calling. Don't forget that. It's, it's the fact now that, you know, it's a Christian race and where you was making gains, but now you have been kind of been obstructed. And, and that does something to you. Because now you got to say, I got to fight harder. And then that's another danger. Now I got to fight harder. No, you got to have a stronger faith life <laughs> and a study life and a sharing life. You see, a Christian stays to himself is a Christian that's not going to survive. Mm. You, you, you know, the shyness, whatever it is in your character, God would take that and remove it and give you his spirit. This is the walk. That's why that trust factor is so important. Is the fact that, Lord, I, I can't do it. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Say so you can't do it. But to stay, say, I can't do it to the degree where you don't want to even make a decision. Say, Lord, I cannot do this, but I know you can. That's the kind of thought we got. We cannot say, I can't do it and leave it at that because that's going to cause us to have some very stagnated experiences. Hmm? I want to get to it because you raised up a question. I want to find this here on this sheet before I close out here. Uh, because it's very, no. All right, here. This comes from uh, Thought of Mono Blessings. It says, whatever may have been our past experience, However discouraging your present circumstances, if you will come to Jesus just as you are, weak, helpless, despairing, our compassionate Savior will meet you a great way off and will throw about you his arms of love and his holy robe of righteousness. His presence he presents us to the Father clothed in the white raiment of his own character. He pleads before God in our behalf, saying, I have, take, <clears throat> I have taken the sinner's place. Look not upon this wayward child, but look on me, Christ said. Does Satan plead loudly against our souls, accusing us of sin? And claiming us as his prey, the blood of Christ, please with greater power. Hmm? Some feel that in a Christian experience, they have need of nothing more. That they are rich and increased with goods. Could they see themselves as God see them? <clears throat> Excuse me. They would acknowledge that they are wretched, miserable, and poor and blind and naked. To such the true witness says, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in fire, the gold of faith and love, <clears throat> that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, the robe of Christ's righteousness, <clears throat> that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see, that not one who reads the description <clears throat> become discouraged and say, is this my condition? <clears throat> mm. I can never be acceptable witness for Christ. Take the word of God and search his pages as never before, that you may learn what it meant to be a Christian. You need not be discouraged. For the one who died to save you declares, ye shall receive power. Power to overcome self and selfishness. Power to reveal Christ as he is, full of grace and truth. Finally, in order to work for God successfully, we must die to self. Surrendering all to God. In words of great tenderness, 
Christ invites, invites us, come unto me, all ye that are laboring heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you respond to this invitation, when you learn what it means to find rest by lifting the cross and bearing it after the Lord, you will be true witness for him. But until this lesson is learned, self will appear and Jesus will be kept in the background. So the Bible says, come unto Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of faith. Though you fall, that doesn't mean it's all. Because Christ still got his hand stretched out. He will not leave you to be a prey. Don't we need to rest in Christ and his righteousness than trying to pray? Well, let me see, can I get this right, Frankie? Don't we need to rest in Christ and his righteousness than trying to pray, study, or witness our way to victory. Uh, I think we gotta, we got to get some clarity. How will you rest in Christ's righteousness if you do not know how to have this righteousness, my dear? You cannot separate prayer and studying and witnessing and gaining victory. See, the righteousness is placed on those who have prepared themselves into your sin. Now, when you hear over my right shoulder, there's a sanctuary. You might not be able to see it, but the sanctuary has three compartments. The outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. It's in the outer court where we have the initial contact with Jesus. That's the born again place. We, we are faced with the brazen altar. We come as we are, but we lay all on the altar to be consumed. All of our known sin, all our known sin on the altar. It need to be confessed of evidence that we have food, meat for repentance. Then after the brazen altar is the labor. That's baptism. Many of us go into the baptism labor without putting our sins upon the altar. We bypass the altar and jump into baptism pool. We come up wet devils. Then when we go from the baptism, we go into the holy place. That's sanctification, my dear. That's why we develop more completely the righteousness of Christ. And there in that holy place, you have the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the candlestick. Prayer, study, and witness. You can't separate it. It's all in the word of God. May God help us to understand his method, his plan for clothing us with that white raiment. This is my highest desire that Lord will empty me of everything unlike his. And when I unconsciously make a mistake, there's no indication that Christ has forsaken me. You're going to strengthen me. And where is the balance? That's the balance. So you, you might not understand this right. Righteousness is a gift. It's Christ. But we can't receive the righteousness Unless we empty of self. And how you know you empty? You got to go to the word of God. Prayer. Prayer is the key in the hands of faith. The unlike heaven's storehouse. Prayers. Yes, we come up wet devils. We want to come up new creatures. Any closing thoughts before we pray? Any closing thoughts out there? Let us pray for the fact that we need that white raiment. Be careful for these notes here. I got some right here for us. May God give us grace to complete this race. Say amen to that. One is a part to one is a part of the other. They cannot be separated. Amen. They they all together are the balance. You cannot separate prayer from the word nor prayer from the word from witnessing. They go all together. Together we're going to have a word of prayer. Maybe we have a closing song. Maybe we can get a stanza of a song that we can sing. And let us pray that God will help us 
to be prepared, to equip, to receive this white raiment. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our gracious eternal Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for inspiration. We thank you that we recognize this white raiment is the very character of righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Lord, the only way we can receive that righteousness, you said, Lord, that if we abide in you and your word abide in us, you will bring forth the fruit of your character. Because without you, we can do nothing. Remember, Lord, help us to remember that you are the word of God, the living word. So when we partake of your word, we are partaking of your spirit. So we cannot separate the word from prayer, nor from witnessing. Because when that word comes into our lives, it will give us a light. We shall be a light to the sin-cursed, darkened world. So the balance is the fact that we must maintain a living connection through prayer, through your word, and bear witness of your goodness in our lives that others might gain courage and strength and confidence and see and behold Christ. And they cry out in their own soul, what must they do be saved? Father, help us realize that our influence could either be a savior unto life or unto death. But I pray this evening, all that was under the sound of my voice, we will be tools in your hand for building up your kingdom. For you coming with your reward. And you're coming for people who have made their call and election sure through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. May this be our highest desire to bring honor and glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. And for his name's sake, amen. Amen. Do we have a closing song?
child of woe, child of sorrow, rest assured you're not alone. Christ has been in your shoes. We are healed by his bruises and by his stripes we are healed. Yes, by are healed. Christ has been in your shoes. We are healed by his bruises and by his stripes we are healed. Yes, by his stripes.